Uh, anyway, um, let's uh, make a start on the, uh, the reflection. This is Lecture 19 continued. Um, as I said uh, on Monday, I'm going to extend the reflection and refraction. I'll do polarisation Friday, and we're going to drop the wire metal shiny part of the course, because that involves complex refractive indices that um, might be a bit difficult to develop in the time. So it was a little bit chaotic on, uh, uh, with my notes. I hope I managed to keep hold of them today. Uh, just to remind you that figure 80 is, sort of sets everything up. Yeah? We've got an incident wave, we've got a surface, and a reflected wave and a transmitted wave. Now, what I started off with, with those angles as shown in that figure, was the facts. And equations 19.1, this is just a review, uh, because it's a continuation lecture. I'm going to spend the first five minutes just reviewing where we got to. And uh, we've got the simple fact that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. We've got Snell's law, uh, which relates the transmitted uh, wave <coughs> to the, the transmitted wave to the incident wave angles via the refractive indices of the two media. And those ones probably were all very familiar to you before the course. These ones maybe not. This is the intensity coat of the reflected ray and this is the intensity of the reflected ray when we've got the electric field vector parallel to the plane of incidence and as I tried to explain for normal incidence these two reflection coefficients have to become equal and are equal to the difference uh, of the refractive indices divided by their sum all squared so those are, the, those are the raw facts that we've got to explain. And uh, this is, uh, the way I set about it was by looking at a general wave equation. So the electric field vector, and we're going to work entirely in the situation where the electric field vector is perpendicular to the plane of incidence, and then I'll just refer to the other calculation. So we can interpret this as an electric field that is oscillating along the z-axis, and it's propagating in the xy plane. In general, we write the electric field as some amplitude times e to the i omega t minus k dot r. And again, I'd like you to get away from the idea of writing the velocity of a wave as the frequency times the wavelength. It goes much better, particularly with the way you study it in solid state physics, and indeed in this calculation, to consider it to be omega over k. Of course, this is 2 pi f over 2 pi over lambda, so it's the same thing, but it's a, a neater way of representing it. And I mentioned that the phase velocity is decreased by a factor n, that's what we mean by the refractive index, and so the k vector is in general equal to omega n over c, and that I made equation 19.7. So that was the general wave equation, and uh, again to remind you that that refers to the situation illustrated in figure 81, where you've got the r vector and the k vector at some point p. And in the end, all that you're looking at is, it, remember, of course, like with all vectors, k squared will be equal to kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared in general. And in particular, in the case we've chosen, where this is the xy plane, there's no component of the k vector out of the plane of the view graph. So we'll be able to use k squared is equal to kx squared plus ky squared. So that um, was then where I, I went specifically for a wave propagating in the xy plane, and exactly now we've got a slightly simpler expression. Now, these are now the electric field vectors of the incident, reflected, and transmitted waves. Now, the the whole point of the calculator, in a way, of course, this, this is a, a very naughty notation because I've got a vector on this side and a scalar quantity on this side, but this is to be understood that this electric field is oscillating in the z-direction and propagating in the xy plane. So, in a sense, the, the geometry is included. Now, I put up an old view graph that I'd used uh, in the last lecture and an eagle-eyed student spotted that in the old view graph, I'd given these a prime 
and a double prime. In other words, and again, this all refers to this uh, figure 84 that we're going to be using a lot of today. The electric field vector is perpendicular to the plane of this view graph. The K vector is in the XY plane. And um, we look at the, uh, the properties of this sort of wave. And principle of superposition, you have to be careful because, of course, in this region, has got a different refractive index to this region. And so we've got to be careful with that point. But uh, clearly, by principle of superposition, if we call this region 1, then I've got a superposition of the incident vector and the reflected field vector. That's just principle of superposition of electric fields. That holds for dynamic fields just as much as it holds for the static fields. And in this region, it's, it, it's extremely simple. There's only one wave. So the, uh, the electric field in this region is clearly equal to the electric field vector of the uh, transmitted wave. And that, at the end of a slightly chaotic, uh, the note-losing presentation, was where we got to at the last lecture, that we'd set things up. Now, the point, if you like, of the whole of the treatment... We'll come back to that figure. I'll probably lose it, of course, on the way, but I'll come back to it if, I'm, if I find it. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in deep detail. The VLE notes uh, go into this in a lot more detail. But uh, what figure 83 is representing is that, first of all, let's assume that this region, just for the sake of simplicity, we can always generalise, is a vacuum. Now, we'll come much more to this next term, that an electric field that we apply to a material creates what's called a polarisation field inside the material. So we apply an electric field, and that's applied in this case by the, um, the incoming wave, and it produces in any material something called, let's just leave it very vague, but it produces a polarisation field. I mean, you can imagine that, you know, just put a static electric field across an atom, well, the nucleus is going to get pulled one way and the electrons are going to get pulled the other. And that creates itself a little electric field that, of course, opposes the, um, the field that we apply. I mean, again, if you just imagine in a static situation and we had a capacitor in this way, then clearly any piece of material, the electrons are going to get pulled this way and the nuclei are going to get pulled this way. And this produces its own little electric field. And this is called the polarisation field. And so we'll, we'll revisit that in a lot more detail next term. But there's nothing to polarise in a vacuum. So the polarisation field here is zero. Now inside the material, so we're now assuming the light, this could for example be a vacuum glass interface, that's the most obvious one to think of, is that you get a polarisation field produced in the material, but once you're any distance inside the material, and you know this literally could be just one or two atomic layers inside the material, it becomes constant. There are some surface effects, but all through the material, the polarisation is, you know, if you, you imagine it's made up of similar blocks, it doesn't matter where you are, if we have similar atoms, you get the same polarisation field everywhere inside the material. So it becomes constant. Well, clearly, the polarisation field uh, goes from zero very, very, very rapidly as you cross the interface, perhaps within, as I say, one or two atomic layers distance. We're talking about this region three here, where we go from the vacuum to the glass, this surface region, this surface region will basically only be some n times 10 to the minus 10 metres thick. So this is a very rapid change. Now, if you differentiate, and uh, again, we'll come back to this next, next term, that you have, a, a, we always know that our del dot e is rho over epsilon naught, and you can see just by looking at this, equation that there's no variation. Remember that the, 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 the surface is in the yz plane. So any term like dEy by dy is naught, dEz by dz is naught, yeah, because there's no variation in the yz direction. But clearly the electric field undergoes some kind of spike 
at the surface, uh, this polarisation field, which is connected with the electric field, undergoes some kind of spike, because if you differentiate this function, well, obviously, the, the derivative is zero all through region one. It, the derivative is zero all through this region. And then in the interface region, it's got a very sharp spike. And so um, this, the electric field is discontinuous in a sense, not completely discontinuous, but has this very sharp spike at the interface. And the only thing that's varying is with respect to x. I'm also going to use the approximation that nothing special happens in the um, magnetic field. A similar sort of graph would apply. The, 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 there's a field here where inside you get what's called a magnetization, and of course in a vacuum the magnetization would be equal to zero. But for non-magnetic materials, this magnetization is also zero and magnetic materials need special treatment but in our case we'll pretend that the magnetization is just zero all the way so in other words the B field is completely continuous right through the interface and the only discontinuity in the system is that the E field varies with respect to X so this is all just as I say it's a long calculation I want to you know set up where we're going with it there's a little table given here, and I say this um, will, what this P, how to calculate this P field, this polarization field, we'll come to next term when we do electric properties of materials. But the Y component of the E field is equal on both sides of the interface. The Z component is equal on both sides of the interface. And we're assuming for a non-magnetic material, remember the whole surface is in the YZ plane and the wave, um, no, the, the normal to the plane is the X direction. The only thing that we've really got to watch out for is a discontinuity in the X direction. So that sets it all up. Now to come back to what this means, let's consider these, these waves and at the interface itself, so uh, we've now, we, we, we can remember that, that this is always this geometry. This is the, oops, the YZ plane. And this, the, the X direction is the surface normal to it. So at the surface plane, obviously X is naught. We choose the, 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 the origin uh, of, to be x equals zero well these three things are related because at the surface region one meets region two and this is the underlying principle of the whole calculation is that these waves must be continuous they can only have one value at the <coughs> interface so if you think about uh, the, the the picture of the interface at this point here, where the, where, where the three waves meet, at this point, it's the same wave. Yeah? And at that point, well, I'll write it on the board because it's uh, uh, important to have, I think, as a, as a note from this lecture. So at the surface, we've got the EI plus ER, which is the electric field in the um, region 1, must be equal to the electric field in the transmitted wave, because it's the same wave at this point. And this is the whole underlying, it, it, you'll see this calculation is often called continuity of Maxwell's equations at an interface. So um, what this implies, so again, I was a, possibly a bit premature in leaving these primes out, but at the interface where x is equal to zero, Clearly, oh, well, it would be clearly if I could uh, find a pen that would do it, this, this term is just zero, yeah? so we can scratch these out. And these three waves are related in a way where the sum of these two is equal to this one. Now, the only way that this, and remember, this is true for all T, and it's true for all T. Why? It's true at any point on, uh, across the interface, and it's true at all times. 
This is principle of superposition of fields. Now, the only way, let's just consider the time variation first. The, uh, the only way that you could possibly get this, if you've got something, let's forget all the other bits, dot, 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 e to the i omega t, dot, 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 e to the i omega prime of t is equal to something else. This, uh, emphatically, these coefficients aren't the same. The electric fields of the three waves are not the same because that would, you know, that would be absurd. We, we, that would mean all the light got reflected or and transmitted. The, co the electric fields in these three waves, the E noughts, the E naught prime and the E naught du double prime are not the same. That's what we've got to calculate today. But whatever they are, they're all oscillating in this way. Now, the only possible way, excuse me, that should be a, a prime there, the only possible way that th oscillations can stay in phase is if omega is equal to omega prime, which is equal to omega double prime. You could not possibly imagine any oscillations in time, vibration, think of vibrations in time, then for any time it's true. So the only way three waves can be equal to each other for all times is for their frequencies to be the same. So therefore, it does drop out of the Maxwell equations. You don't even have to put it in that omega must equal omega prime, which must equal omega double prime, and therefore... But that's not an interesting result. We know if we shine red light at a surface, the, the wave that bounces off is red, and the wave that's transmitted is red. And if we shine blue light at a surface, the same applies. So clearly... Uh, it, it drops out. But then likewise, if you consider the spatial part, here you've got an e to the i k y y, an e to the i k prime y y is equal to an e to the i, <coughs> excuse me, k double prime y, again, times all the other stuff. Well, again, this is now true for all y. It's true across the whole interface. So the only way you can get continuity of the waves at the interface by exactly the same argument is that these three also have to be equal. And if you like, you can think of this too. Like, the, the, Imagine the slab is, is in the YZ plane. Well, the only variation in property... In other words, here's the vacuum and here's my glass, for example. The only variation in property is across the x-axis. So you, you, another way of thinking of this, rather than the mathsy way, is to think, well, how could the y component be changed when the, the mater both materials are completely homogeneous in, in the y direction? So two ways of thinking of it, whichever way you think of it, um, you, you get the results that omega prime is equal... I'll, I'll write this on the other board because I think this is, is worth making an actual note on. So by continuity... Sorry, I should have... Uh, I think... Like, let me just check I uh, get the, the right notes here. By continuity of the waves at the interface we get omega is equal to omega prime is omega double prime and and uh, I'm sorry I, I kind of put that in intuitively but uh, I kind of regret doing that uh, in the presentation last time because it is nice to see that it actually follows from the continuity that these three have to be equal of course after they're equal we can just call them all omega as I did previously, and then likewise, by the same argument, because this, these waves are always equal for all y, the only way you can organise that is by having ky is equal to ky prime, which is equal to ky uh, double prime. And this one I took for granted, but this now is a new equation, which I'll make uh, 1914. So now we use the, uh, a crucial point that k squared or k dot k this is the way we're going to uh, develop the calculation k squared is equal to omega squared n squared over c squared 
So this will make equation 1915. And this is obviously follows from equation uh, 19. Seven. So let's go. Uh, I've got, got now into the uh, the new bit of the calculation, and <coughs> we've got now this equation for the uh, the k squared. And again, this is just the definition of the k vector for a wave in a medium with refractive index n. So of course, I can square equation 19.7 and get k squared for all of the, uh, all of the waves. So that's the, um, the setup. Well-equipped lecture theatre has uh, presumably got a board rubber somewhere. Yep. Anyone want to volunteer to become a window cleaner while <laughs> that be across? Uh, but I think this, th this calculation, because it's a very long one, I know in this, in this lecture theatre I've used some of the um, o overheads, but uh, I th this is a long calculation to follow. So, um, so we've got then, um, <coughs> excuse me, we've got the, in let's just write, ca in, in any case, we've now got k squared is equal to kx squared plus ky squared. And we've also got that k prime squared. I'm just going to work with the reflected wave. There's a, an, the, the motivation for working in the re reflected wave is that both the incident and reflected waves are in the same medium. So for the reflected wave, the refractive index is the same. Yeah? For the transmitted wave, we have a different n. So um, for the, clearly again, I, I'll use this one, this board, while I've still got it available. I think once you've got this idea, you can get that k squared for the incident wave, there's no prime here, is just omega squared n squared over c squared. Yeah, this is the incident wave. And k prime squared is equal to omega squared n squared <coughs> over c squared, where this is the same n. Yeah, that's why we work with the, the incident and the reflected wave. We will have to, again, let me be, let's call this n1. This is the incident wave in medium 1. Well, k double prime squared, though, is equal to omega squared n2 squared over c squared. So it's easier to work with this pair and work out reflection than it is to work with the transmission. Though we will, of course, when we want to get Snell's law and the intensity of the refracted ray, we will need to use this. But we just start with this one. So coming across here, it's, it's like my jog in the morning. You sort of get fit, ha have a lecture in BO45, you know, <laughs> do a bit of jogging. So my, but also my, my K1 squared is equal to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, my k prime squared is equal to k prime x squared plus k prime y squared. And because this k squared is equal, yeah, these, th these are equal, because it's in the same medium, that's the important point, is that in the, uh, because these are both in the same medium, these are equal, we've already said that these are equal, as a, b because the interface is, is in the yz plane. So therefore, it necessarily follows that kx squared is equal to k prime x squared. Yeah? These two things are equal, these two things are equal, so therefore these two things are equal. So <coughs> we get that... Um, Therefore, we get that k prime x is equal to plus or minus k x. There are two, of course, there are two solutions to this. The squares being equal means that they can be equal to plus or minus each other. So 
This is purely from the Maxwell equations and continuity of the waves at the, at the interface. Now, uh, a bit of jogging again. Forgets the blackboard rubber, comes back. Be a couple of kilos lighter at the end of this lecture. Yes. Work off my muesli. <laughs> well, morning cigarette and coffee, anyway. <laughs> Not, I don't really go jogging. This is, this is the most exercise I've done all term, I think. <gasps> Here we go. But anyway, um, the solution... So, obviously, there are two solutions here. Now, um, oops, k prime x equals minus, e e equals kx, sorry, let's take that first, just gives us another incident wave. I mean, it's a trivial solution because this, now our k prime, if you, if you, if you have kx, ky, and k, with kz zero, kx and ky are both equal and omega's equal, you've got the same wave. So the solution kx prime is minus kx gives us the reflected wave. Let's make this actually equation 1917, because we're going to need it later, uh, gives us the reflected wave. And equations uh, 1914 and 1917 give us theta i is theta r. Excuse me, I forgot to label it, this one here. This is the, 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 the solution to the equation. It's got two solutions, the kx and kx prime being equal, just is the incident wave again, because it's got the same kx, same ky, same kz, same omega. So this solution gives us the reflected wave. And again, I'll, I'll just get the, the geometry there to... Um, Let's just uh, actually get a picture of that. Once you've got it to this stage, you see now what we've proved uh, here, there's our, our K vector of the incoming wave. Let's try and find a pen that works. K vector of the incoming wave. We've proved that the, um, the KY must be the same from continuity of the wave across the interface. And we've proved that the solution for the reflected wave, kx prime, is exactly equal and opposite to kx. So it's simple then trigonometry in the, if you like, you could, of course, this angle theta i here is equal to this angle theta i here, and this angle theta r here is equal uh, to, <coughs> excuse me, the angle in this right angle triangle here. So you've necessarily got, once you've got that the KYs are equal, so these are e uh, exactly equal, and the KXs are equal and opposite, you have immediately proved that these two angles are equal. And indeed, a neater way of stating that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection is to state it in terms of the Ks of the incoming and outgoing waves. We've got that ky prime and k uh, is equal to ky, and these are equal and opposite. And you might think, well, we've now done an enormous amount of work. We've got up to equation 17, and we've proved that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, which seems like a long way round to go. But this method will give us something completely new. So I'll maybe add a comment there that... Uh, to convince yourself that the, the, this relation of the, K, if you like, equation 1914 is that KY prime is equal to KY. And so the combination of those two, just by trigonometry, as shown in figure 82, gives us the first of the five laws that we want to calculate. You can imagine we have to do a little bit more work 
uh, when we're in the, um, in the second medium. So let's do that next. The, uh, <coughs> my notes have gone again. There's something about lecturing on reflection and refraction that does strange things to one's notes. But they're in here somewhere, I hope. Uh, all right, so sing a little song time again. Here we go. No, I actually have got them. So, for the transmitted wave... Yeah, for the transmitted wave, we've got K x double prime squared is equal to omega squared n2 squared. And it's you know, very important to note that this is now in a different medium. Um, so k double prime squared over n2 squared is equal to k squared over n1 squared. We've now got a different medium so for the transmitted wave, for any wave, this, if you square it, because again I've subtracted, same argument, I've subtracted off the equal uh, parts, which are the, the ky parts, are subtracted off and use the fact that, the K, that we can immediately talk about the kx squareds in this case. So <coughs> for real n, and this again, this, you, this of course now only works for real n. If n was... This is where the, 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 the uh, refractive index of metals gets complicated because you, you have to consider this to be uh, a, a complex number and then things get a bit difficult. But for real n, uh, we have got that k double prime over n2 is equal to k over n1. And this is in our equation 19. 18. So if this is just a real number, then these are just real numbers and we get this nice simple relationship between the k vectors. Now again, if you refer to figure 82, sorry, this has gone a little bit, this has gone a little bit blurry here. If you refer to this figure here, you can see that the angle theta t here is such that the sine of theta t, you know, the opposite, sorry, this triangle's gone a bit blurry, the opposite is equal <coughs> to ky over k, yeah, where k, uh, excuse me, k uh, double prime, because we're in this medium, I, I should, yeah, I could write this as a double prime or I can write it without because it's, uh, it's equal to ky. But if I look in this medium and I look at this angle theta i here, I've got that sine theta i is equal to ky over k, yeah? So combining, so it's a bit of a mixture here with the, you know, having so few blackboards, if I then combine that with this relationship, that k double prime over n2 is equal to k over n1, I get k sine theta i is equal to k double prime sine theta t, and this can be written as n1 sine theta i is n2 sine theta t. So you get Snell's law from this calculation. So again, here, we've had to restrict our attention to real n in order to get this relationship out. And this relationship, combined with the trigonometry, the simple trig of the problem, that this angle's theta i and this angle here is theta t gives us Snell's law. So that is a very nice thing that we've done, but that again, we haven't learned anything new at all. To get something new, we, um, we, we then have to uh, consider 
You see, we haven't actually had to consider the amplitudes of the electric fields of the three waves at all in this argument. We've just talked about their K vectors, nothing else. This has all just been from the argument of the K vectors. But um, if we want to calculate the um, magnitude of the wave in this, remember this is some E equal to an E naught double prime something. The magnitude of this wave is an E naught prime times something, and this is E naught times something. And we've worked out just from the continuity of the waves that we must get Snell's law and the, uh, the reflection law. Now, if you want to get the uh, relationships between these, well, one of them, oh, let's uh, maybe go back to this board now. So you s we still haven't learnt anything new, and yeah, we've been going for a lecture and a half, and maybe a bit more, and all we've got is theta i is equal to theta theta r, and and, and Snell's law from it. So um, we're and we're up to equation 1918, weren't we? The one that I've just rubbed off. So we're now going to go specifically because this is the easier case to treat to figure 84. So we're going to use. Specifically now, I'm only going to do, you know, uh, the calculation for the perpendicular polarisation case. So, um, in the so considering perpendicular polarisation, and this is illustrated in figure 84 of the course handout, uh, we have, well, first of all, we've got E, again, this is just from the continuity of the E field at the interface. We must have this equation from continuity of the E field at the interface. Remember, right at the beginning, we had that this is the... Uh, so, in other words, that uh, because we've got this EI plus ER is ET at the interface, because it's the same wave, then that necessarily implies that at the interface, the magnitude of this wave plus the magnitude of this wave these are just the magnitudes of the incident and reflected waves, must be equal to the magnitude of the refracted or transmitted ray. Now, I reached now a point where I thought this over, and on the VLE notes, I follow the calculation from first principles for the, continu the implication of the continuity of the B fields. However, I'm aware that, you know, if if we want to get onto polarisation at all and not spend the entire time this week on reflection and refraction, that I've decided to just cut straight to the point. And so I'm sorry that this, this, this step might seem a little uh, artificial, but it, it is treated in the VLE notes in detail. Continuity of the B field at the interface you see, the, in a, if you like, what we're doing conceptually is we're fitting together some very complicated waves at the interface. They've all three got to have their E field and B field perpendicular to each other. They've all got to be representing the same wave when we're actually at the interface. And this puts enormously strong restrictions on the form that the waves can take. Uh, I'm not going to prove this from first principles. It is on the VLE. It implies that Kx E0 plus Kx prime E0 prime is equal to Kx double prime E0 double prime. So then, equations 19 and 20 combined, we've got two simultaneous equations which we can use to eliminate the um, 
<coughs> the, the field. So uh, let's do it using kx prime is equal to minus kx. We've already proved that, and that was equation 1917. So this is a very, I don't know, this is probably the longest calculation you've you know, probably ever followed through. Uh, you know, we, we've got a few to go yet, but um, we're now up to uh, this stage. We can, it's just algebra, yeah? We know kx prime in terms of kx. We can uh, eliminate kx prime to write the boundary conditions, as they're called, the boundary conditions just mean the waves join up at the interface uh, as, certainly get plenty of time to write these down while I stroll across again. So this really is a blackboard lecture, so let's keep going this way. You've got these two simultaneous equations and this is now just algebra that you can then, with these conditions, write that E naught prime is kx minus kx double prime. Note that this, ob obviously you can eliminate kx prime because we've eliminated that using that it's equal to minus kx for the reflected wave. So simple algebra reorganisation of the equations. When, once you've eliminated kx double prime, gives you this relation, which will make equation 1921, and the electric field vector in the transmitted wave is 2kx over kx plus kx double prime times E naught. So we finally got, we've had to use the law of reflection and to eliminate k prime. So we can now express the electric field vectors of the reflected and the transmitted light in terms of the electric field vector of the incident light. Well, that's the one that's under our control. We control, if you like, the amplitude of the source, which is producing the electric field. That's, you know, in the end, going to be uh, the, if you like, the independent variable. These are the dependent variables. And because of the angle of incidence being equal to the angle of reflection, we can express that just in terms of kx and kx double prime. So that is the, the philosophy of the calculation. <coughs> I think we are going to get there by... So <laughs> with those two equations... We get our overtime on the camera as well today, so the tracking camera whizzing backwards and forwards. But, uh, so the, uh, once you've got to those two equations, again, this comes back to figure 82. This is just the geometry uh, for real n's and k's. It's all we're going to deal with in this course. We can write... Of course, kx, this is just trig. Again, this refers to figure 82. kx is now equal to k cos theta i. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll see if I can, somewhere in the mess of view graphs on the floor, locate the, uh, the relevant figure. Of course I can't. Uh, you've got it on your handouts, which is then equal to omega n1 over c cos theta i. Only got a couple more equations to go, you'll be pleased to hear. And kx double prime by the trig is equal to k double prime cos theta t. And that can express that as omega n2 over c cos theta t. We make this equation 1924. So we've got these two expressions. 
for kx. This, is, this again is trig. This is from figure 82. If we want to relate, kx is just equal to k cos theta i. That's the hypotenuse uh, and, the and, and uh, this is the adjacent. So similarly, in for the transmitted wave, and we now use, so substituting equations 1923 and 1924 into 1921 and 1922. So we now substitute these expressions for kx prime sorry, for kx and kx double prime, into these equations here, nine, these two equations. So again, it's, there's a lot of calculation, but it's really essentially a series of algebraic substitutions. Now we've gone past the calculus and linking waves up. All we're doing really is a load of algebra. So again, this is something you may want to follow through, and it, uh, I've set a problem on it as well. So you'll need to follow it through in this week's problems. Uh, you, it gives, it's just the algebra of plugging those two expressions into the previous two expressions. You get E naught prime over E naught is equal to N1 cos theta I minus N2 cos theta T. And then this is all divided by N1 cos theta i plus n2 cos theta t. So again, we're just following through with the algebra, and we've now reached equation 1925. So we've got now an expression. We're getting close to the answer because we've now got the ratio of the electric field vector in the reflected wave to the electric field vector in the incident wave in terms of refractive indices and angles. So we've now eliminated K using those two expressions over there. And now, of course, we can set N2 equal to N1 sine theta I over sine theta T, which is just Snell's law. And multiplying... numerator and denominator. This is just a, a, a technique by sine theta t. We get. So in the end, of course, I'm perfectly entitled to use Snell's law yeah, and replace this thing here by N1 and then sine theta i over sine theta t. Yeah? And I'm perfectly entitled to do the same in the denominator. And then I've got my n1 sine theta i over sine theta t here. And now, finally, you see my n1 comes out of the whole expression because I've got n1 in the numerator and N1 in the denominator, and the refractive index cancels out. That's an awkward-looking expression, so I multiply it by sine theta t, so multiplying by sine theta t there, and sine theta t here, multiply by sine theta t here, and sine theta t here, it gives me an expression purely in terms of the angles. So, so, so it's a long, involved calculation, but we have now reached the penultimate step. I deserve overtime for this lecture. I won't get it. I'll just as the head of the department. Look, look how much running I had to do this morning. You know, I'd like some overtime. So that final <laughs> substitution. Uh, it gives uh, that uh, <coughs> final substitution gives the missing page, of course. E naught prime over E naught 
is equal to cos theta i sine theta t. I'm just copying the expression here to make it look a bit neater. Minus sine theta t cos theta... Oops, sorry, sine theta i. Excuse me, yeah, sine theta i cos theta t over cos theta i sine theta t plus sine theta i cos theta t, equation 1926. And this is therefore equal to sine, this is just a simple trig relationship, sine a minus b is cos a sine b minus sine a cos b. Similarly in the denominator, this is sine theta i minus theta t, that's just a straightforward trig relation over sine theta i plus theta t. Actually, let's make this one uh, 1926 because it's a bit more useful in this form. So we've finally got this relation and the reason that we've done it all in this medium, we've now got this relationship of the incoming electric field amplitude to the reflected electric field amplitude and both waves are in the same medium. Yeah? This is now again an important point. This is why we work in the, with the reflected ray to work out the, the, the so-called reflection coefficients because these two waves are in the same medium. So since we couldn't take this step otherwise, so I really want to make it explicit, since the E0 prime and E0 are in the same material, the intensities are proportional to the squares of the fields. And particularly, we could think of this first medium as a vacuum, a proportional to the squares of the fields. Again, we've used this throughout our study of optics, that the amplitude of any wave has to be squared to give its intensity. So the reflection coefficient which is IR over II, is equal to the square of the ratio of the amplitudes of the fields, which is equal to sine squared theta I minus theta T over sine squared theta I plus theta T. And this last but not least, equation 1927 is the same as the empirical fact that we started with, equation 19.3. So it's a long, hard road. I'm not, you know, I'm not pretending otherwise. That I can't see... Feynman actually uses about 50 or 60 equations. He goes through everything from first principles, including that derivation of how the continuity of the magnetic fields <laughs> at the boundary um, gives the right answer. So... You can do, of course, a similar calculation for when the electric field vector is in the plane, but it is yet longer and more tedious than this one. And you can also extract from the calculation, obviously, if you get the reflection coefficients as a function of general incidence, you can work them out for particular angles, uh, for the particular angle of normal incidence and prove the remaining relationships. So... As I say, I've taken two lectures on that. We're changing the plan. Friday, I'm going to do polarisation, and then next week, I'll go straight into energy. We'll finish the optics topic Friday, and Friday's lecture, I think there's only one equation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Squared. Always square the amplitude for the intensity. Thanks very much. Oh, after all that, missed my final square. <laughs>